Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Emily Clark, uh, Information Specialist for the NCCMT. Um, I'm the coordinator for the Spotlight webinar series brought to you by the National Collaborating Centre for Methods and Tools. Thank you so much to those of you who have joined us this afternoon for the Spotlight webinar series. Today we will be featuring the Knowledge Translation and Implementation video series uh, by Dr. Melanie Barwick. Um, first, a few quick housekeeping things before we get started with the presentation. Uh, there is a chat section at the bottom right-hand side of your screen in WebEx. You can post any questions or comments that you might have during the webinar. We will have a designated Q&A uh, session at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to post any questions or comments you have during the webinar. We will try and answer those as we move along. Um, we'll also review them at the end of the session to make sure we haven't missed any. Please post your comments to all participants, as other participants may have the same questions that you have. We do recommend today that you use a wired internet connection as opposed to a wireless connection. And if you have any issues today, you can use the WebEx 24-7 helpline. The phone number is posted on this slide and will also be posted in the chat section. Following today's session, uh, the PowerPoint presentation will be made available in both English and French um, on the NCCMT SlideShare account. The English audio recording uh, that you're hearing right now will also be made available on the NCCMT's YouTube account. We usually aim to have these posted within about a week of today's presentation, and you can keep an eye out for those. We'll start with our first of today's uh, couple of polling questions. We're just looking to get a sense of the audience that's joining us today, uh, so we're wondering how many people are watching today's session with you. Um, please indicate if it's just yourself, if there's a couple of you in the room, four to six, six to ten, or if you are in a larger group watching the presentation together. You can answer this question in the polling question panel um, on the side of WebEx, and just remember to hit submit so that your answer actually gets recorded. So it looks like most people today are joining by themselves. We have a couple of smaller groups, and that's wonderful. We're happy to have you all here. So I would like to officially welcome everybody to um, the NCCMT Spotlight on Methods and Tools webinar series. This is our 33rd episode of the Spotlight series and we'll be featuring the Knowledge Translation and Implementation video series. We will be posting links to the registry page for this tool um, and links to the website in the chat section as we move along through the presentation. Uh, unfortunately, it's not possible to click on links on the slides themselves, and that's why we're posting any links that we include um, in the chat section as well so that you can interact with those. For those of you who might be uh, less familiar with the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools, we're actually one of six NCCs across Canada. We're all funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, we here at NCCMT are located at McMaster University in Hamilton, uh, but the other NCCs are located coast to coast from BC through Nova Scotia. Um, while the other NCCs that you see listed on your screen focus more on specific topic areas in public health at uh, methods and tools, we focus on uh, providing access to and uh, improve the use of methods and tools for health professionals in practice within Canada. So it's less content specific, uh, but we do offer methods and tools that can be applied, applied across all areas of public health. Um, on the slide are just a few of the many products and services that we offer both in person and on our website. Uh, many of you might be familiar with some of these. Today we are highlighting one of the tools in the registry of methods and tools. Um, also you can take, take a time to note um, we do offer online learning opportunities like online learning modules, um, multimedia videos that explain basic concepts, um, and we do also offer workshops as well if you are interested. Uh, we've now reached our second polling question for today. We are wondering how many of you today are familiar uh, with the tool that we're discussing today. Um, so the options are that you're not familiar with the video series, um, that you've heard of it, or that you've actually used the series in your practice. So we're just curious to see um, what your background knowledge is before we get started. Again, after you answer the question, just make sure that you hit submit at the bottom right hand side. Um, and it actually looks like we've so we've had a couple people who have used uh, the video series. Uh, a number of people are not familiar. A number of them, have, a number of people have heard of the method and tool. It looks like a pretty even split between A and B. Oh, and we're up to four people who have used it 
Uh, so that's really great, and we'll be interested to see if you have anything to contribute at the end during the discussion. That would be wonderful as well. Um, I would like to now formally introduce our presenter, uh, Dr. Melanie Barwick, uh, from the University, or sorry, from the Hospital of Sick Kids. Um, Melanie has a extensive resume here. Um, she is the head uh, child and youth mental health research head of the child and youth mental health research unit. Um, psychiatry senior scientist, child health evaluative scientist, um, and research institute course director um, from the Hospital of Sick Children, and also part of uh, a professor in psychiatry at the Dalla School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. So Melanie, we really appreciate having you here today to present the video series. Um, and I will, um, normally what I do at this point is hand over presentation control to Melanie, but since we actually have a couple of videos embedded in uh, one of the quirks of our WebEx system, it's not a glitch, we're told this is how it works, but one of the quirks is that I can't hand over uh, control. So I will be advancing slides for Melanie. Uh, Melanie, just let me know when you need it advanced, and we apologize for that in advance. Thanks so much, Emily. Um, hi, everybody, and, and thanks for joining us this afternoon. And uh, yeah, I'm awfully sorry that you're going to have to hear me say next <laughs> a million times. Um, That's our fault. We're sorry. <laughs> um, we can go next. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is just sort of taking you through um, some of the implementation videos that we developed at the end of a um, a large emerging CIHR emerging team grant in knowledge translation in the child and youth mental health sector. And um, the way I've organized it is really to give you a brief overview of some of the key concepts in um, evidence implementation that are highlighted in these videos. I'm going to show you the videos because they're super, super short. Um, and um, and then at the end, I want to just uh, spend um, a couple of moments to identify some key considerations for sharing knowledge in video format. So looking at it now, not from the content of implementation science, but rather from the lens of um, knowledge translation. Next, please. So uh, this is the project um, from which the videos uh, were developed. Um, uh, it was a really long and large project, which we're still <laughs> struggling to to um, get published, um, uh, mostly because it's just been a, a beast of a thing, and we don't want to cut it up into several papers. Um, so uh, this was a project looking at um, implementation of an evidence-based practice in four mental health organizations in Ontario. You can go to the next one. What we did is we implemented motivational interviewing in these four organizations, and we guided our implementation with NERN's um, active implementation framework, and also um, measured key implementation constructs against uh, Laura Dan Schroeder's consolidated framework for implementation research. Next. Um, and so at the completion of our research project, we um, uh, we secured a um, communications company, and uh, we sat down with them to discuss what we thought we learned and how we might create some animated videos that would capture some of the main messages um, that uh, emerged from this very large project. And our goal, so those of you who've taken my training or who know me or have heard me speak, is that I always think about knowledge translation beginning with a knowledge translation goal, which is to say, what's the reason for the creation of your KT activity? Um, and uh, in this instance, we were really looking at some short educational, informational vignettes animated um, on video to generate awareness and interest in the work that we did and the, the evidence that we produced, but really just simply to share knowledge about what we learned. Um, and so it was very short and sweet and simple and focused in terms of our goals. Next, please. So um, what I'm going to ask uh, Emily to do is show the first uh, video. Um, it's about the first half minute uh, is some um, introduction, and then you'll get to see the video, and then we'll uh, talk about it.
Thanks, Emily. Um, I wonder if we, yeah, so um, what I've highlighted here is just the key things that we tried to portray in this first video. One of the things you'll notice is it's pretty short, and that was intentional. Um, so anything that you're putting online, um, evidence-based or otherwise, you really want to retain people's um, attention. Hopefully that retained everybody's attention. Um, and so we were very selective in sort of what did we want to say in this very short minute and a half. Um, and so the main messages that we included here was this notion of how you have to plan for implementation. Um, and uh, I think it's something that's oftentimes not considered very mindfully. We have a tendency, at least in behavioral health, to select an evidence-based practice and quickly round up people that need to be trained, find an expert to do the training, we send them to the training, we send them back to their offices, uh, to their job sites to, to implement it. And um, more often than not, the process fails because it's not just about training an individual and embedding new knowledge or new skills in an, in an individual. Um, it's not just about changing what those people do in their job. The changes are organizational, they're systemic, and they require planning. So people have to understand what to expect in an implementation process, how to plan for it, um, how to structure their time. They have to understand something about implementation processes and what strategies are going to be effective. And so that's hard for some people to hang back because once we've identified a practice, we're eager to get people in front of it. Um, and so what we learned in this study was uh, we would, had we done this research a second time, we would have planned even for more time to prepare what we call often um, the organizational conditions for practice change. So that was a big lesson learned. Um, and we, we knew that going in, so we did carve out some time for this, but even that wasn't sufficient. Um, how much time, you might ask? I'm not entirely sure, but certainly in the matter of at least a month or two of working consistently to prepare an organization and to get them at that level of readiness. Um, the other thing that's portrayed in this video is the importance of leadership, keeping a vision in, in, in your mind um, what I call a postcard destination, where are we headed, how are we getting there, how are we going to be supported to get there. Um, and that as you develop a plan and you consider what that, um, the stages and steps and activities of that plan are, it's important to have fidelity to the plan, not just fidelity to the evidence-based practice. And I'm going to talk about fidelity in one of my other clips, so I'll hold off uh, saying too much here. Um, and then throughout the whole process, communicating the change, keeping people informed, keeping them no knowledgeable about the process, um, reminding them about where we're going with this change initiative, how we're getting there, what kinds of supports are available, what are the incentives to keep people motivated. Really important to motivate people for change and not just give them um, the specifics of the activities and the expectations um, relative to the change initiative. So people need to know where they're going, but they also need to be motivated to get there. Next slide, please. And um, can I also just ask, Emily, that you advance to about 32 seconds in so we can skip the intro. You can just slide your, your advance up to that point. Thanks.
Thank you, Emily. So here in this video, we've focused in on the notion or the concept of an implementation team. And this was first brought into the literature by the folks at the National Implementation Research Network as part of their active implementation framework. Um, and so we wanted to give people a little bit of an idea of who's on the team. You'll notice that for each of these videos as, as we go through them, there are temptations, perhaps more so for me because I know what I might add to the content of the video, there are temptations to kind of say more, drill more, talk more about implementation teams. But that defeats the purpose of keeping to main messages and keeping your message simple and concrete. Um, and so that's just a little bit of a, of a KT um, teaser for you there. Uh, we talk about the importance of, of um, bringing in champions of change, um, who should be on your team. But we talk about this very loosely because, of course, team composition is going to differ, um, differ widely depending on whether you're talking about a hospital, a mental health center, a community organization. Um, so context is going to come into play there. But we do say, look, think about who has the skills that um, they can bring to uh, the project management piece of the implementation, who has implementation experience, but also bring in people who are going to be the recipients of the change or the enactors of the change. Oftentimes, decisions made about what to implement or how to implement involve senior leadership. Um, and that's great, and it should, but it should really also involve the people who are going to be the deliverers of the intervention. Because unless you get them on side, having senior leadership on side is necessary but insufficient. Uh, implementation teams need to consider what they have to do. So in order to have um, some direction, they need to have an implementation plan. Uh, when we worked in our study, we set up the teams and we really wanted the teams to work independently of our research team. We wanted to be more observers of their implementation process than facilitators of their implementation process. Um, while that was uh, probably good for research reasons in the sense that we were less of a, of a confound or less of an implementation support or intervention ourselves, it was problematic because our implementation teams in the four organizations weren't too sure about what they needed to do. And if you don't know what you need to do, you don't know what you need to talk about, and so you don't meet. And so for many of them, they simply didn't have organized implementation team meetings. Um, and then again, we reiterated this notion that people really need to feel the need for change, and they need clarity on what you want them to do. Um, so some element of support for what the plan should look like, what the steps are or the stages are, what are the activities of the team, the roles and the responsibilities, is, um, are all things that need to be considered in the implementation process. Next slide, please, Emily. So this slide is about treatment fidelity, and um, we'll just play it.
So here the main messages are, what do we mean by fidelity? So what we wanted to demonstrate is this concept of fidelity. Um, and it really pertains to um, characteristics of the interventions that are responsible for creating the effects that you see when you look at effectiveness of that intervention. So as we said, you know, we, we sort of used a, a cooking analogy here, or a baking analogy rather, but in mental health, for instance, when we think of interventions like cognitive behavior therapy, for example, we can identify through research um, what are the core mechanisms of, that make it cognitive behavior therapy. And just for argument's sake, we could say CBT has five core features. Um, motivational interviewing also has core features. And that's how you know that that's the type of therapy or treatment that you're providing. Um, and so the, the issue then becomes in sort of clinical delivery is are you really delivering that intervention with fidelity? That is to say, have you incorporated all of the components that you need to that are the key components of that intervention? Or have you gone rogue? Do you think you're developing or delivering CBT or motivational interviewing, but in actuality, you're delivering kind of a version of? And so if you're going to version of, you have problems with respect to what you can expect in client outcomes. And so fidelity is linked to client outcomes, and data would suggest that the more fidelity you have to the intervention that you're delivering, the better your client outcomes. So here we wanted to give people this introduction to treatment fidelity. In our field of behavioral science, it's not something that's oftentimes, I would say for the most part, discussed in clinical service delivery nor are we using fidelity tools for the interventions that we're providing, unless, of course, those interventions are supported by purveyor organizations that are assisting with training and coaching and evaluation. So it's easy to go rogue, and fidelity is an important feature. Uh, it requires knowing the active mechanisms of change for the intervention that you're delivering. It involves critical reflection of, uh, you know, an opportunity for practitioners or clinicians to say to themselves, how am I doing? And to look at their practice relative to perhaps a self-report measure. Very infrequently are you going to have other people looking at your fidelity uh, during clinical practice. Um, and while this is sort of a, a, a lofty aim, it's a lot easier said than done. In our study, when we went back two years after the end of the study to see whether um, clinicians were still using motivational interviewing in these four organizations, we found that they were, but they were no longer using the Becky to measure their fidelity. There just seems to be a sense that, you know what, I've been doing this for 20 years, uh, I know if I'm being effective. And that's problematic. So the issue of how to develop a culture of fidelity uh, is only alluded to in this very short um, video, but um, it does tap into a larger issue um, that warrants some consideration. Um, just thinking if there's anything else I wanted to say about this. Yeah, the other thing I'll mention about fidelity is that there's really two types of fidelity you want to pay attention to in any implementation initiative. The first is, as I've described in this video, it's treatment fidelity. Are you delivering the intervention in the way intended by the developers, uh, such that you can reasonably expect to see the outcomes that um, would be comparable to published outcomes? The other type of fidelity is fidelity to the implementation process. We don't talk about that in this video, um, but essentially it's about making sure that if you're following an implementation process, a series of stages um, or um, steps, that you're actually going through those stages and steps in some sort of coherent fashion. You're not going too quickly, you're not skipping steps, and you're able to demonstrate in a sort of a tracking manner that you were able to keep to um, the steps of your implementation program. Uh, so for instance, um, the quality, Im Im quality implementation, um, no, sorry, quality improvement framework developed by Abe Wandersman and his colleagues um, has 14 steps that delineate the process of implementation. And you could gauge and 
sort of track how you do in those 14 steps over the course of your implementation and thereby demonstrate fidelity to your implementation process. So two types of implementation fidelity. Next slide, please, Emily. So this is about coaching for change, um, and we'll have a look at the video. Thanks, Emily. That's great, and I think if that's it for videos, I will hand it over to you and you can advance the slides. All right, thanks. Um, so here what we tried to capture is um, that people need coaching. And again, this, this harkens back to my earlier main message, which had to do with this notion that we, we typically rush to train people and then we kind of leave them hanging. Um, and um, what's been demonstrated in um, research in, the, in education, for instance, um, uh, many years ago now, looking at teacher practice change um, with different sort of models of support and training, um, it, that it's not unless teachers have this sort of coaching, um, someone who they can um, go to with questions, someone who can help them think through what they know and what does that look like in the classroom and how can they actually apply their skills. That's when you actually, when you have that kind of support, when you have coaching, sometimes called consultation, when you have coaching, um, is it, that's really what, what gives people the, the self-confidence um, and feelings of, of adequate competence to uh, deliver the, their new skills in their work environment. Um, so we have to think about a coaching or a consultation model as part of an implementation uh, approach. It's more than just sharing and training. It's actually a lot of hand-holding. Um, it can be um, a big time commitment, um, but it's really, um, really, really important to get people to uh, have that level of support. I, th I guess in the, in the health literature, it might be akin to academic detailing or any other kind of detailing. It's really that one-on-one -on -one kind of support. And uh, it's essential for um, demonstration of that new evidence in the practice setting. One of the things to consider in organizations is where is that coaching going to come from? Uh, so that's something uh, that all uh, organizations need to think through and wonder, you know, is this coach going to be someone that they develop internally? Does it become a new role internally, like a practice lead or a clinical lead, someone who ramps up with the new intervention um, in advance of everybody else and to a different standard than everybody else initially so that they are on site to provide that kind of support? And or, you know, could be a blended model, but an alternative model would be um, uh, coaching support that comes externally. Um, from um, an organization that supports and trains for that particular intervention, what we call a purveyor organization. Um, that support might also come from uh, an intermediary knowledge translation or implementation support organization. Um, so in, in the Ontario context, we have organizations that provide, that are intermediary and that provide implementation support in their sector. Uh, so the Ontario Centre of Excellence for Child and Youth Mental Health is one. The Provincial System Support Program at the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health is another. 
um, to some extent, Health Quality Ontario, um, to a large extent, the Council of Academic Hospitals of Ontario with their Arctic program. So those pockets of technical assistance coaches and supports for implementation exist within sectors here and there. Um, so thinking about where that training is come, where that coaching rather is coming from, um, what it means for training within your organization, what it also means for sustainability. Um, if this is external coaching that's being paid for, how long can you actually maintain that? If it's internal coaching, um, you have to be careful to pick people to train up who you think are stable, likely to stay on the job for a while, or you're, or you're going to have some retraining um, issues at hand. So always an important consideration. Back to, uh, there we go. Um, so I want to um, just give you an idea of uh, how um, some knowledge translation considerations. And in fact, I'm going to advance to the next slide and come back to this one. Um, so um, one of the things that um, we were really mindful of from the start, as I mentioned in my opening comments, were what my main messages were. What, are, what, what did we think as a team our main messages were going to be that we wanted to um, uh, translate, share, uh, in these um, animated vignettes. And what's really difficult for researchers oftentimes is to tailor it down to a main message. Uh, because we like to try and say everything, because quite frankly, we've spent five years doing this research and we think everything is important. Um, so that's the process. And I take the time to be really careful about what your main message is going to be. Um, particularly if you're aiming to follow good uh, video guidelines and keep things short. You want to consider how you're going to evaluate, evaluate your impact against your KT goals. So if you'll remember at the get-go, um, we decided that the KT goals um, for this particular strategy were going to be developing awareness and sharing knowledge. Um, you want to take the time to perfect your script uh, when I worked, uh, when we worked with the communications company, uh, the script was ours for the making. We had to sort of identify what our main messages were, what we wanted to say, how we wanted to say it. Um, and, um, you know, I think also working with fun communications folks, whether they're in-house within your organization or whether you're seeking an external organization to help to work with you to do this, uh, one of the uh, sort of unanticipated benefits for me of this process was that it really helped to clarify the message. So when I initially met with this communications company uh, and our team, we had sort of a team huddle with them, and we they just let us talk about what we did, what we thought we learned, what we thought was important, uh, what we thought the relevance of what we learned was, and the potential impacts of what we learned, and just being able to wrap your head around it in that way with um, in conversation, in dialogue with a group of people who don't know your field, who are not researchers, who are not in your area, really helps you to figure out, am I really clear on what I learned, who is going to benefit, what needs to be shared, and um, then creatively together you can come up with what the best strategy is. Um, if you don't want to work with a, a comms company to do this, you can um, do, um, do a video yourself. Um, Videoscribe is one uh, open access uh, software that's available. Uh, works off of PowerPoint where you can add audio um, and you can do a range of different things. Um, so that's one option. Um, and then you want to be thinking about how you're going to evaluate um, and share your impacts. Um, and so how are you going to drive traffic to your videos and your KT deliverables with social media? So just flipping back for a second to the earlier slide, this is just a, a view of the YouTube um, analytics or web analytics uh, that give you an idea of reach. So have we made more people aware of what we found out? We think we have, and the indicator of that is a reach. 
What we don't know from this is whether we shared knowledge in a way that was well received. So the YouTube metrics are not going to give you an idea of um, how the information was received by the viewer. It won't give you information about whether the viewer uh, perceived quality of what was shared, how they might use the information that was shared, how useful they may feel the information was that was shared, or even whether they, in fact, continued on the sharing process and disseminated it further, unless, of course, you tweet and you can, um, you can look at retweets. Um, that sort of concludes what I wanted to say about these videos, both um, the main messages and the content that emerged from the research and the KT considerations. Um, I, we certainly have plenty of time to um, take some questions, um, and I'll do my best to provide answers. Um, before we move into that, though, I want to take an opportunity to advertise uh, two new and emerging um, things. Uh, one is our global implementation conference that may be of interest to those of you on uh, the call. Um, this is happening in Toronto in June. Um, June 19th is a pre-conference academy of half-day concentrated workshops with implementation experts and leaders, and the conference at the Sheraton on June 20th and 21st. So please have a look at that online. Uh, the other thing to share are new reporting standards for implementation studies that we re recently published um, in BMJ and BMJ Open. So go and have a look at those. Um, I think I had a slide. I didn't realize that uh, one of the one of the WebEx funny things is that you can't put an animation on like two animations on one slide. So um, uh, I think that concludes what I have. Contact information for me, and then I'm happy to take um, some questions and we can have a bit of discussion. Wonderful. Melanie, thank you so much. Um, I think that was a, a fantastic overview of the implementation series. Um, I, I know I certainly enjoyed the video. I really, first of all, I love the aesthetic. I think they're really cute. Um, and they make, the, they make the content really, really accessible. So um, we are now available to take questions. Um, in order to post your comments or questions, you can do that in the chat window. Um, again, we encourage you to send them to all participants so that everybody else can follow along. Um, I will read out the questions for uh, Dr. Barwick or for anybody who's listening. Um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, um, I mean, a question that I had for you was, how did you, how did your team then, I mean, you discussed main messages and deciding what your main messages were. Do you have any tips on, on actually focusing in on, on, on how to determine what those main, uh, what those key messages really are? I think you have to talk about it. And, you know, um, there, there's a different kind of clarity that comes from talking to people who are, outside of the work, um, external to the work, um, uh, about what you did, what you learned, because it helps with your plain language, it helps to simplify, it helps to identify um, where have you sort of lapsed and gone into code uh, or jargon or made assumptions about what the listener or the viewer may understand or um, the you know, um, their knowledge base. Um, so the main messages really are process, um, mm -hmm. trying to pass them out, and then, of course, um, simplify them. So keep it tight, keep it short, keep it concrete, uh, and try not to say too much. I mean, yeah. remember, remember that, you know, for a project like this and probably for any project, these animated videos are not our only knowledge translation deliverable. You know, mm -hmm. we publish in academic papers, we present at conferences, we reach out to the scientific community. Um, we wrote, um, you know, plain language summary. We did these animations. We presented at conferences for practitioners. Um, gosh, uh, what else did we do? Um, you know, and, and this is just all in a way to, to kind of layer your information. 
everything you learned in a particular project does not need to appear in one specific KT deliverable. Right, I think that that's great. That's really important. Um, we, we do have another question that's come in. Um, curious as to how the language of implementation science lands with average people. Um, in my experience, it is a bit academic and could be more human. Any insights on translating terms like fidelity and implementation into terms that might resume, resonate better? Um, it's a good question. I don't have an answer to it because I'm not the general public. Um, I think, you know, it comes back to plain language. And the basic principles of plain language are, of course, to say things simply with fewer words, um, to use uh, simpler language, plainer language. But there, are, there also is the flip side of increasing scientific literacy in the general, public, and general population and the practitioner population and so on. And um, words like, you know, coaching are pretty colloquial. People understand coaching, which is why I think people use that term, even though some in the literature it's really called consultation, which is a little bit more formal. Um, a term like fidelity um, is not, I mean, it, it has a different meaning in our everyday language, but I think well, the way we tried to address it was to give people um, an analogy through sort of a, you know, the baking analogy, baking a cake, um, to make it concrete for folks. And yet introducing the term fidelity is important because it really is an important element of good clinical practice and something that needs some attention. So I wouldn't want to swerve around it or avoid it. I'm putting it out there for everyone to see. I'm using this term. I'm teaching people what does this term mean? How should it be thought about, um, at least at a high level? Um, implementation team, people understand the notion of a team. That's not too complex. So I think it's a bit of um, a balance um, between uh, being understandable but also there are some terms in science that are not avoidable, and I think that's okay. And using um, analogies and visuals and checking your language or your scripts or your written work with people who come perhaps from a broader knowledge user perspective are good strategies to kind of keep you grounded. Great, thank you. Um, we do have another question. Uh, wondering about getting buy-in for planning time. Uh, it seems that is not emphasized enough and viewed as slowing the process down or being overly cautious. You're absolutely right. <laughs> um, didn't say any of this was really easy to do. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's super important, and it's important for all levels, so governments, funders, um, system level people, um, uh, decision makers at the high end, medium decision makers, and everybody to understand this tough, this stuff takes time. And um, I think, you know, driving home some thoughts about what people need to understand about what's going to happen in the implementation process. Um, you know, it's, it's really, how do you get buy-in? You've got to be convincing. You have to demonstrate where other people have failed, where they've been successful, and what the defining features have been, so bringing in some evidence. Um, I think appealing to uh, people's sense of um, understanding complexity because, of course, implementation isn't the only place that many people will experience complexity in their jobs. This is complex. It's not simple. Um, and it's iterative. It requires some, you know, back and forth. Even if we're talking about 14 steps, you might there's some recursion that's happening uh, here and there. Um, you know, I don't have a great kind of do these five things and this will solve your problem. I do think it needs to be recognized as a problem, so it's a fantastic question because it is something we have to contend with. I think it's particularly important for funders to consider that implementation is a process that requires 
um, this planning bit, but also time. And, you know, so as you develop research, so the researchers on the call trying to develop research and implementation that has to happen in real world implementation context and trying to fit that into short funding timelines when it actually may take longer in the real world, it, there is a disconnect and it's very frustrating. Um, you know, one piece of evidence I show people when I try to get them to understand that there are steps and there's a sequence to these steps for any implementation process. Um, one of the uh, graphics that Wandersman uses in describing the, the quality improvement framework is um, just a graphic of the four stages of implementation. And stage one, he, you know, for each one, there's sort of a little call out for this round quadrant, uh, round circle with quadrants within it. And stage one, there's this long list of everything that has to happen in that phase or stage, com comparable to a couple of bullet points for stage two, three, and four. And I always highlight here for people this is what I'm talking about when I say the first stage that involves planning and preparation is so important because look at everything that has to happen here. So that's just a kind of a concrete teachy kind of thing that I do with people and I would do that in an implementation process that's active in any kind of context. Great. Um, we have a, a comment here as well um, regarding fidelity. Uh, fidelity makes sense when work is complicated but counseling is a complex intervention rather than complicated. Uh, therefore, both parties are influenced while going through the process. For example, parenting is complex, baking is complicated. I don't know if you had a comment for that as well. Uh, we can also move on to the next question. Well, I'm just, just to point out that, I mean, I mean, absolutely true, and language is important, so if I, I misrepresented something, my apologies. I think what we're trying to capture in fidelity is fidelity to a prescribed intervention. There's no way to look at fidelity of parenting. Um, we're talking about fidelity to a prescribed intervention, typically manualized, where there are key components of that intervention outlined, which is precisely what makes it that particular intervention. So you're, you're looking to see, is the clinician, the practitioner, adhering to those key components as they provide that intervention. Because if they're not, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean they're not effective, but it means that they're not providing that particular discrete intervention. That's all it means. Great, great. Um, our next question is, do you have any suggestions for evaluating outcomes of the implementation? Um, well, Yes and no. <laughs> um, there are some tools available uh, that allow you to do that somewhat generically. Uh, Lisa Saldana, who is one of my collaborators and works out of the Oregon Social Learning Center, has developed a tool called the Stages of Implementation Completion, the SIC or the SIC. Um, and uh, it's based on particular stages, and there's a process of um, uh, collecting information along the way about what stages organizations are moving through as they move through their implementation process. So that's one methodology. Um, I would say, you know, a lot of the time, you're sort of left to just simply tracking. So if you're, if you're using the quality improvement framework, um, 14 steps, you can just track manually as you're working through your implementation. Step one, done. Step two, done. Step three, done. So on and so forth. Um, it sounds pretty simplistic, but that's really what you're trying to capture is, you know, if these 14 steps are really important, if we actually work our way through these 14 steps. The SICK uh, measure sort of does that as well, but it looks at it relative um, to stage of completion and also duration of, of time in each stage. Um, the theory being that if you skip a stage or 
go through a stage too quickly, you might not have done it justice. Or if you're languishing in a particular stage, uh, you might be languishing. <laughs> and you might need, need some support to, to get moving and, and through to the next stage. So those would be top of mind ideas for that question. Wonderful. Um, but we haven't had any questions come in now in a couple of minutes, so um, I appreciate everybody who has submitted questions. This did make for a really great discussion. Um, we have a couple of wrap-up questions for you, actually. Um, your feedback is really important to us. Oh, and I see another question did come in. We will come back to this, um, so don't worry, we'll come back to the question. But I have posted here um, another polling question because we are interested in knowing how useful this is to you. Um, so we have a last couple of polling questions. Those of you who are still tuned in, let us know if you think that this tool um, could be useful uh, in your practice, in your work. So please choose your answer. Um, don't forget to hit the submit button at the bottom. Again, um, if you do have any questions in the meantime, um, please feel free to post that. I'll make sure we come back to uh, any questions or comments that you have before we wrap up here. Um, so yeah, it looks like a, a, quite a few people think that this will be, um, we've got a, a good split between A and B, so everybody does think this will be useful, so I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased to see that. Um, and again, as, as we mentioned, your feedback is really important to us. Um, especially here at the NCCMT, evaluation is, is uh, high on our priority list. We're looking, uh, hoping that you can take a few minutes to share your thoughts on today's webinar. So there is a brief survey, uh, it takes a couple of minutes. Um, I believe when you close this window, it'll actually take you to the survey. Um, and I think Rawan will also post the link to the survey in the chat section as well, there it is. Um, so please take the time to fill that in. Uh, that really does help improve the resources that we offer and help plan future webinars as well. Um, and then um, speaking of future webinars, um, the next webinar in the series, oh, actually, we're going to do our polling question first. Um, what do you think uh, your next steps are in terms of the tool we talked about today, um, in terms of the KT and implementation video series? Um, this question is a little bit different. You can actually check all, um, all that apply. So whether you think you might access the tool um, and go in and watch the videos again, uh, read the summary that we have in our registry, consider actually using the tool in your practice or telling somebody about, about the videos and seeing if there's somebody that you know that you work with who might be interested in that. So um, again, I'm seeing a really uh, pretty even response across questions. Looks like people will be using this and passing this along to their colleagues and, and that's really wonderful to see. Um, I will point out then, so our next webinar in this series will be um, exactly one month today on Friday, May the 5th. Um, the next spotlight topic are the online training modules for integrating sex and gender into health research. Um, this will be presented from a public health perspective. Um, we've spoken with the presenters and they, they're aware of our audience and so this will be tailored a little bit more as well to, to this audience. Um, but it seems like a timely presentation given uh, current events and current debates. So um, the link to register for that one will be posted in the chat as well. Um, and just coming back, I saw we had one more question come in. Um, so Melanie, hopefully you, you, you can still answer this one. Um, we have a question, do the videos include resources that were used to support key messages? Uh, for example, the, um, the poster is interested in coaching. Um, no, we didn't. <laughs> didn't, um, but that would have been good. Um, if you know, so if we had created some more linkages um, to resources, but then it's sort of it's it's hard it's hard to keep that updated. Anytime you have a link to anything, you know, links break, and um, there's some challenges associated with that. And then you'd also would have had to have a process of you know really reviewing what resources are out there, which ones were you going to highlight. And again, it gets into being this big thing and it's no longer a tight little video. So, yeah, <laughs> we don't do it. Um, you know, if you are looking to the literature for literature on coaching, it's really, um, you need to look at the term consultation, not coaching. Um, you know, we have a paper that we are uh, in the midst of uh, revising as well. So all of these papers in revision, you know. Um, 
uh, on co on consultation um, or coaching relative to this project. Um, but if you want to reach out to me, whoever asked the question, if you reach out to me um, on my email, um, I can uh, share the references from that paper and get you started. Great. Alrighty. Well, um, a huge thank you to Melanie um, and to everybody else who joined us today. Um, I will uh, wrap it up now. I'm going to pass it back to Melanie in case you have any more comments for our audience, uh, but we, we do appreciate to everybody who joined and participated. Um, this did make for a good discussion. Thank you so much, and we really do hope to see you next month. And uh, Melanie, back to you. Well, just to say thank you, Emily, and thanks everybody for joining this afternoon. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much.